Good morning. I'm Jennifer Simpson. I'm a faculty member at GHEI, and I'm going to be moderating this session, Transformative Breakthroughs for Medicine. Our next speaker, for many of you, um, doesn't need an introduction, but uh, he, Dr. Napoleon Ferrara, is the Distinguished Professor of Ophthalmology and Pathology at UCSD Medical Center, and he serves as the Senior D Director of Basic Science uh, at the UCSD Moore's Cancer Center. Dr. Ferreira has been recognized for his groundbreaking work in identifying the role of VEGF in promoting angiogenesis, as well as um, the development of two major monoclonal antibodies that he's going to be talking about. Uh, Dr. Ferreira was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2006. He has won numerous scientific awards, uh, too many to enumerate, but I am going to let you know that he's the recipient of the Lasker DeBakey Clinical uh, Medical Research Award and the Dr. Paul Jansen Award for Biomedical Research. Dr. Uh, Ferreira's talk is Anti-VEGF Drugs, Breakthroughs for Human Disease. Please welcome Dr. Napoleon Ferreira. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for this very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a really honor of uh, follow up after so many distinguished you know, speakers. I really, it, it's a fantastic you know, place to be. So let me tell you my story. So I, I believe, I don't think that this, this topic needs much of an introduction. The idea that you know, the, the, the ischemic rating, the disease you know, rating, uh, produce an angiogenic factor. This is an idea that goes back already to the, to the 40s you know, with the seminal work by Michelson. And actually, there was already a similar hypothesis being made about you know, cancer already in the late you know, 30s. You know. But certainly, Judah Falkman in the early 70s with this really seminal uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper really put all this you know, biology, all this idea, where a little bit you know, neglect, you know, put them in the map. You know. And certainly, it was the first one to envision the therapeutic application of, of this field. You know. By that time, this, this was easier said you know, than done, the, uh, actually, because uh, this, this I, the hypothesis you can block angiogenesis to affect the human disease uh, imply that you need the first you know, to identify the molecule, the mediator of angiogenesis, and find a way to block that. You know. but already by the mid-80s, when I started you know, working in this field, there was already a lot that was already known about. You know, people had already isolated you know, a number of angiogenic factors, like you know, the most you know, notably were acidic and basic FGF. But there is actually, this is only a very incomplete you know, list. But this quote you know, from uh, Mike Langsprun, you know, which is a really very insightful you know, uh, uh, investigator, really very pioneer in this field, you know, made it very clear that the fact that a molecule can induce angiogenesis in some bioassay does not in any way predict that this molecule really play a role, you know, as a mediator of angiogenesis. Because, for example, acidic and basic FGF are probably still the most, you know, potent angiogenic factor. But, you know, when you try to knock out, you know, the, 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 the gene, there was very little happening in angiogenesis. If you use antibody, there did very little or nothing. So there was something which was still missing from, the, in, from this picture that perhaps, you know, actually was very, actually very fortunate to, uh, actually to give a contribution I would like to remind you how the discovery process was different in those days. Now all genes are known, actually, almost every, there is incredibly powerful technology. Those were the days when people were speculating on how many hundred thousand, if not, you know, millions of genes might exist, you know. And so there was a very, very few genes actually were known. The way to, most of the time, to go for, to a gene was at first, you know, to start, you know, from the protein, you know, from a biological activity. You needed to, to identify an activity, to isolate, you know, the protein, to homogeneity, and then based on the amino acid sequence, actually, you, you, you design some probe, you know, to do some cloning. And this is actually a, a, a molecule which I identified, we call vascular endothelial growth factor. It actually started from a work, I was a postdoc at UCSF, when I initiated you know, this work, and we found an activity you know, made by pituitary cells. We purified this protein, actually. And this is this, uh, the, CD, the, the cDNA. You know, I don't expect anybody to read you know, this fine line. But the, pro the point is this molecule was, uh, uh, this, uh, on top you have the bovine, and, and below is the human you know, cDNA for VEGF. And there was over 95% you know, identity, which suggests that this was really very conserved you know, molecule. And, uh, and now today, uh, the, 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 
two decades, you know, almost you know, three decades later, we know much more about you know, the, the VEGF you know, pathway. Uh, 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 probably for, for those working in the rating you know, field, it is a very well, it's a very well-known pathway. There is a, a VEGFA, which is the prototype you know, a, a family member, actually the model that we are isolating. You know. But there is other, more, other uh, uh, VEGF-related you know, genes called VEGF and, pl and placenta, VEGFV or PLGF, you know, and VEGFC and D. And, and there are some tyrosine kinase you know, receptor. VEGF you know, A interact with the VEGF receptor 1 and VEGF receptor 2. And instead, you know, VEGF C and D interact you know, with, the, uh, with the VEGF receptor 3, uh, which is a path which is mostly involved in involved lymphangiogenesis. Instead, you know, the VEGF you know, pathway now seems to be very clearly is a, is a key regulator of, of imangiogenesis. You know. And between the VEG, the, now it's very clear that the, the signaling receptor is a VEGF receptor 2. And VEGF receptor 1, even though it's highly related, you know, the, the, there is a very high level of homology, still its biological role is very unclear. But to now to be studying this molecule could lead you know, to design some, some important you know, therapeutics, actually. This is a, of all experiment that I can show you to illustrate you know, the importance of VEGF you know, in biology. This is still, after maybe over 20 20 years, so this is still makes the point very clearly. You know. Inactivation of a single allele of the VEGF you know, gene results in embryonic lethality. This is a mouse embryo at day 10.5. You can see this is the wild type. On the left, you, know, you can see there is this very nice, you know, uh, uh, once again, I cannot get it to work. Vascular pattern you know, in the yolk sac, you know. And then on the right, you have the mutant, the heterozygous, actually, which actually is already severely underdeveloped, if not already, already, already dead, you know. And so this is a very critical molecule in, 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 in angiogenesis. But of course, you know, to study you know, the, 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 the role of, the, of uh, the, 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 an approach you know, that we, we, we undertook you know, to study you know, the, the, the role of this model was the first you know, to develop some monoclonal antibodies. It is a, this early study published in 1993, this was done before we had you know, this, this knockout you know, data, this genetic data, already gave an idea that VEGF could be an important molecule, actually. This is a, this is a monoclonal antibody called A461, actually. This antibody is the precursor of Bevacizumab boravastim. And allow us to do the very first, you know, in vivo experiment to probe, you know, the role of VEGF, at least, you know, in tumor angiogenesis. And the study, this early study showed that if you block, you know, VEGF, you can have a very profound inhibitory effect, you know, as much as a 90%, a 95%, you know, inhibition of the tumor growth, you know. At that time, this was very surprising because people expect, you know, that to block angiogenesis, you need, you know, to block, you know, maybe a dozens of the different angiogenic factors. This turned out to be actually uh, very, very surprising. And the subsequent you know, genetic data support you know, this idea. And actually, uh, at the time, and actually, this, it, it, an important point is this antibody is a species specific. So blocks, you know, human and primate, you know, VEGF. It does not really have any significant inhibitory effect on, on mouse or, or rodent VEGF. So this kind of approach, you know, preclude, you know, doing lots of studies, like, for example, studying genetic model, you know, uh, because you can only block, you know, tumor-derived, you know, human VEGF, you know. At the time, there was an approach that we actually, we consider actually, uh, which was based on VEGF receptor 1. I was telling you at the beginning of this receptor, you know, even though it's, it's a signaling property, are kind of very weak, you know, compared to VEGF receptor 2, but can bind VEGF extremely well, actually. There is the VEGF receptor 1 bind VEGF with a very low picomolar affinity. At that time, we thought, you know, that actually that, you know, uh, uh, we could uh, take advantage of this uh, uh, very strong, you know, binding characteristic to develop, you know, some, some, some new reagents, some new inhibitor. This, uh, uh, the, uh, this receptor is a 7 immunoglobulin-like in the, in the extracellular portion, so it's a very large, you know, molecule. So it is a very difficult to, to uh, it's a very, very limiting you know, bioavailability in a flight. And so we thought if we could identify the critical binding domain for VEGF, maybe we can design a better inhibitor. And actually this work was, uh, was done in our lab, you know, like in the mid-90s at Genentech. Oh, great, great. Thank you, thank you. 
And, and so we thought you know, that actually, if we could identify the binding domain, we, we could design a smaller and better inhibitor. And actually, it turned out to be that you know, this binding was exquisitely modular. At the time, it was thought you know, maybe you need the multiple domain to bind you know, VGF. Instead, you know, domain to, to now to be the critical binding element. You know. Probably the most compelling experiment if you replace domain two of VEGF receptor three, which it does not bind in you know, VEGFA, bind instead in you know, VEGF C and D. This, this receptor now is acquiring all of the binding characteristics of VEGF receptor one. It binds VEGFA and PLGF, you know. And, 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 and in fact, we designed this molecule, which called it uh, FLT123 IgG. And this molecule at that time, in, in that period, when we didn't have any, any better reagent, any different, turned out to be extremely useful to, to probe in the role of VEGF, actually. This is a model of hormonal induced ovulation. You can see that actually this model, you, you administer this uh, uh, hormones, uh, PMSG and, uh, 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 and uh, and HCG, and within five days, you have this enormous you know, growth of the ovary. There is an angiogenesis, probably rivals, probably the most aggressive, the most malignant tumor. But the treatment with this, with this inhibitor, with the soluble inhibitor, essentially completely inhibits angiogenesis. And, and actually, at that time, and, uh, we did a series of other studies, but other investigators follow up on this work, actually. One was a, a group of Regeneron, actually, which in, in, in 2002, actually, they actually they uh, uh, they follow up on this work what, what uh, our molecule they, is, called, is referred to as the parental VEGF you know, trap and they made a number of variants actually to, uh, to make you know more diffuse more bioavailable you know and, and now we, uh, which is uh, at the time was called VEGF R, VEGF trap R1 R2 and now it's called a flip percept, you know and this molecule the, the binding is still mediated by domain 2 of VEGF receptor 1 and that there is a domain uh, domain 3 of VEGF receptor, uh, receptor 2, which it does not contribute any specific binding. But, uh, but, uh, and this molecule become a clearly successful therapeutic, and actually, and there is another follow-up, another molecule developed actually in China, which is called Combreceptin, which is based on exactly the same principle. Domain 2 of VEGF receptor 1, it, it does all the job of binding of the ligand. And domain 3 and 4 of VEGF receptor, receptor 2, actually, uh, actually uh, they add, you know, domain 4 compared to a flip receptor, maybe for IP issue. And this molecule is a very similar characteristic as a, as a flip receptor. At the time, actually, in spite of our work, our company, Genentech, was very interested in developing an antibody. That's what they want, you know. And this is the approach we took. We actually, we humanized the monoclonal antibody, which I showed you at the very beginning. We used in this uh, preclinical study. It is the full-length antibody is called Bevacizumab or Avastin, actually. And this antibody actually underwent, you know, a, 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 a clinical trial first in cancer. And this is actually was the, the very first, you know, study that, you know, to test, you know, the hypothesis that block, you know, VEGF as a benefit in humans. This is studying patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. The study was uh, reported at ASCO in 2003. It was published in 2004. As you can see, there is a significant increase in, in overall survival in patients with the colon cancer. At the time, this was really a first, you know, for a biological agent, you know, to show a benefit. And actually, after almost, you know, 15, 14 years, 15 years, Bevacizumab is still is a standard of therapy in colon cancer. Actually, it's been approved, you know, maybe for uh, is about, you know, 10 FDA approval. Now, on the other hand, I believe that there is actually clearly no, you, you, you have no cure cancer. Nothing, unfortunately, is as yet, you know, cure cancer, including immunotherapy, etc. And so there has been a lot of interest, you know, in improving, you know, the activity of an anti-VEGF agent. And actually, this slides in a very simplified way, illustrating, you know, some of the, um, the pathway and potential targets in the vessel wall, like, you know, totally the VEGF receptor, but even you know, the very important molecule is called a type Two, which in, is a tyrosine kinase, and the, the, which has the two main ligands, you know, NG1 and NG2, which has been implicated, you know, actually in, in vascular remodeling. You know, it's very important for the for uh, actually uh, uh, a proper assembly of the vessel wall. Another important target, the PDGF receptor beta and PDGFP, probably a very familiar target, you know, in ophthalmology. There was lots of hope, you know, that this could be important, you know, target to improve the active anti-VEGF agent, you know, and also, of course, there is other 
other, other targets like it, HGF and, and MET, you know, which is uh, among many other things also has been implicated in angiogenesis. Other targets have been actually uh, integrins like you know, alpha V beta 3 and alpha 5 beta 1. And there was a lot of hope you know, that this actually could you know, combine you know, this, this agent which target you know, this pathway with, the, with, the, with anti-VEGF can result in actually in an additional benefit. And unfortunately, at working done over the last you know, 10 plus years, they show that unfortunately it's very counterintuitive, it's very disappointing. None of this has worked. You know. For example, the anti meta antibody called onartuzumab, you know, there is a, actually many other inhibitors, paradoxically it decreases you know, patient survival for reasons which are not very clear. You know. we, we have recent data that, you know, in, at least in, in cancer, that you know, target NG2 with a bispecific antibody called CROSMAB, but they never have any benefit in colon cancer. There is very recent data presented you know, by Genentech that in, in, uh, in, uh, in DME, there was a little bit of benefit, you know, but you know, the data a little bit unclear because it, it, a different reagent didn't show any benefit. So the story is, uh, is uncertain. And there is an inhibition of PDGF receptor signaling, you know, also has not shown benefit in cancer. And as you know, has not shown benefit you know, in, 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 in cancer. And the targeting also PLGF, you know, which is another uh, target is, is, is show very little, if any, benefit. For, so this is a very complex issue, actually. And we've been actually interested, you know, in our lab, you know, for the number of years, you know, in actually the possibility, you know, that the other pathway, uh, unrelated, you know, to the conventional pro-angiogenic pathway can play a role. We've been, actually, we came across a number of years ago, actually, in, 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 in myeloid cells, you know, in, in uh, cells which have been implicated in inflammation in, in angiogenesis, actually, as a potential mediator of, you know, resistance and escape to anti-VEGF agent, at least in cancer, in, in, in eyes, may be a very different story. And, and so this, there is this population of CD11B GR1 myeloid cells, which include, you know, mostly neutrophils, macrophage, and the cells known as my, my, uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, which can inhibit some T cell mediated you know, function. And actually, work that we actually uh, we, we identify actually in a, a key mediator made by the myeloid cells, which is a molecule called, you know, BV8 or prokinetin 2, which actually is very strongly induced, you know, by GCSF, by other myeloid, you know, growth factor. This is a, a family of a small protein, which is about, you know, 9,000 molecular weight, you know, which is uh, highly enriched in cysteine. It is, it, 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 it is molecule interacted with some two GPCR receptor, which are actually, so it's a very different system, you know, compared to the VEGF receptor, which is in, uh, utilized, you know, tyrosine kinase. This utilizes um, GPCRs. And actually, so we came up with this path which actually a series of papers from our lab as well as from other lab, you know, delineate, you know, this path with actually this, uh, actually GCSF, you know, actually uh, uh, acting, you know, in, in myeloid, you know, progenitors in the, in the bone marrow, which actually uh, expand, you know, this population and actually it result in upregulation of this uh, small protein, which result, you know, in v, can result in VEGF independent angiogenesis. And actually, to that way, the RAS, you know, path which plays an important role because in activating or RAS, whether it's due to mutation or, or, or activation by tyrosine kinase, result in increase in you know, transcription of the GCSF, which initiated you know, the cycle. Actually, work with, uh, this work was done mostly in, in the years at Genentech. More recently, actually, we have a, a paper actually in revision that showed the importance of this pathway in colon cancer, actually. Whenever there is inflammation, actually, this pathway plays a very important role. A blocking of EGF is insufficient to have a great benefit. So I believe that this is, could be a paradigm of, uh, of the way things go, actually. But clearly, the, 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 the importance of EGF turned out to be probably even, uh, uh, even greater in, in, the, in, in, in ophthalmology than in cancer. This is actually a very old you know, paper published now uh, to, over two decades ago in collaboration with, uh, with Aiello and, and George you know, King, you know, which is show was the first, you know, one of the first you know, correlative studies showed that you know, the level of EGF in the eye fluid, you know, Correlated very strongly with the with the, the presence of angiogenesis, you know, in ischemic retinal disease. I think the study is very well known, so I'm not going to spend much time in that. And this was the study in collaboration with Tonya Demis, you know, and John Miller, 
provide a really proof of concept, you know, in this uh, primate you know, model. Actually, we were able to use, you know, this uh, the uh, antibody uh, A461, where it showed that, you know, in this model of a of a uh, uh, iris of a um, laser induced, you know, a, a retinal vein occlusion, you have this almost complete inhibition of, of angiogenesis by blocking of VEGF. At the time, however, it was believed that you know, it, uh, uh, AMD could be a more interesting target because there was a really completely unmet you know, medical need at that time. Instead, you know, there was a, an effective treatment for ischemic retinal disease like a diabetic retinopathy. Laser-induced you know, co uh, photocoagulation could be very effective. Instead, at that time, there was virtually nothing for AMD. And actually, once again, you know, Dr. Cooperman already illustrated you know, very well you know, the different stage of you know, AMD. So actually, it's a great introduction, I don't need to spend any time other than say that, you know, now it's very clear that, you know, uh, AMD is, is, is a continuum, is a, is a spectrum of disease, very frequent there is a genetic component, a mutation in the complement, you know, pathway. And clearly, a, a, a neovascularization is a key component of advanced AMD, actually, it's the main cause of blindness. Because of, it, uh, uh, because of the blood vessel destroyed the photoreceptor, you know. And in, in the mid-90s, actually, we, uh, when the very little was known, actually, there was much more was known about, you know, cancer, we thought to target, you know, this pathway for, for AMD, actually. Uh, uh, at the time, uh, there was a very big dilemma, what kind of reagent you want to use, actually. Uh, the, the, we had already developed a bevacizumab or but there was a lot of concern, you know, based on what was known at that time, that, you know, the FC could uh, could be pro-inflammatory, could engage you know, in inflammatory cells, could, could, in, uh, 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 could even potentially even make you know, the disease worse. This was a point of view espoused by some immunology in our company. There was also concern that you know, a full-length antibody may not be as, as good as penetrating in the retina as a, as a fab. You know. It was thought you know, that, a, that an antibody fragment actually could be, could be could be safer, could be better, actually. And, 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 and this was led you know, to the development of ranibizumab, which actually, compared to this full-length antibody, is more potent. There is a fine mutation which results you know, in a great you know, biological potence. And actually, this, this, this slide illustrates you know, some of the antibody, different you know, antibody moieties, actually. This is the FAB, which is there is a constant region in, and actually in, in, in the variable region. There is a, it's a mono valent antibody. But now, more recent, we've seen evidence that even a smaller moiety, which is a single chain FB, actually, containing only the variable region put together by a linker, actually. This antibody is called brolucizumab, you know, developed by, by, by Novartis. It turned out to be it's a very interesting molecule because it targets only the EGFA. It turned out to be, it, actually, the study illustrates, you know, very powerful the importance of the dose in an issue which has been largely neglected. They gave a dose of a Brolucizumab, which is about you know, 20 times higher than the dose of uh, ranibizumab, and have a molecule which you not know, only is highly effective, you know, but actually last, you know, probably seems to be last longer than anything which has been tested as yet. You know. <laughs> and actually, the, the, the issue of the dose was already uh, 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 perhaps emphasized by this early study with ranibizumab. Once again, you know, the study is very well known, I believe. So the, the two doses of 0.3 and 0.5 you know, milligrams show that you know, the 0.5 milligram was a, was a little bit, you know, better, actually, appreciably better than the lower dose of, of the ranibizumab, you know. But uh, uh, Genentech did not really fully explore, you know, the dosing issue, actually. P perhaps, you know, they, they did a, a study, the Harbor study, comparing, you know, with, with a two milligram, you know. And in, in the first, you know, year, it didn't show any difference compared to the 0.5 milligram. But two years, there was al already a difference, you know. So in retrospect, you know, maybe they should have, the study should have been pursued the more vigorous, the more aggressively. This illustrated some vascular biology concept, actually, about, about you know, the effect of, of anti-VEGF in the eye, actually. There is, a, there is a clearly very rapid effect, you know, and there is a long-term effect. Now we understand that the blocking of VEGF, you know, is a very profound effect, you know, in actually in, in inhibiting you know, the growth of the CMV. And, but even the short-term effects are very important, resulting in, in, probably in, in, in uh, 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 rapid gain in visual acuity because these blood vessels, you know, under the influence of VEGF, uh, 
are very, very abnormal. There is a number of structural abnormalities. You know. There is this well-known microaneurysm. You know. uh, there is a loss of perisite, which has been described in an early study. You know. And, and, and if, if you block you know, VEGF, you know, these vessels, which are really very, very, uh, uh, very abnormal, can be pruned, you know, can, can regress. You know. And that may explain some of the initial benefit. But clearly, long-term benefit requires this long-term you know, inhibition, actually. And actually, it's been, uh, uh, in, in, uh, the, the question is, what is the long-term you know, benefit of anti-VEGF you know, therapy? This is another very well-known study published by Bressler in, uh, in the, by the Bressler in, in uh, 2011, which predicted that if patients could be treated you know, with anti-VEGF agent, like in clinical trials, there could be as much as 70% uh, uh, reduction in the incidence rate of, of blindness. You know. It turned out to be that the story was they were not far off. You know, this is another very well-known study, a study done in Denmark, you know, and published in 2012, you know. And actually, it, it illustrates, you know, the incident, the, the incident rate of legal blindness, you know, in, in, in Denmark, you know, in, uh, in, over a period of 10 years. The lower curve reflects, you know, causes unrelated, you know, to AMD. And the upper curve reflects, you know, AMD. They don't distinguish between dry and wet AMD. But nevertheless, there is about, you know, there was a, they noted there is about a 50 percent, you know, drop in the incidence rate, which I believe is very remarkable. And they note, you know, that this, you know, this reduction coincided with the introduction of this intravitreal, you know, uh, anti-VEGF agents, you know, in, in, in therapy. Other studies have shown that another very important, you know, points actually about, you know, anti, the effectiveness of anti-VEGF, you know, therapy. This is a, a study done in Europe, you know, illustrate how the location can make an enormous difference, actually. The outcome is, is different, let's say, the best, you know, outcome is in, in the UK, uh, which uh, actually, even though they are not, you know, uh, uh, the same approach to outcome in clinical trial, actually. There is uh, this thing, uh, gains in visual acuity, which actually, there is a little bit of loss, you know, but also because in the second year of treatment, there is a patient's the compliance was a little bit, you know, less. The worst you know, outcome, I'm really very sad you know, to say, is in Italy, my, my native country. Actually, actually some patients receive maybe one dose in two years, actually. So illustrating you know, the importance of this therapy requires a continuous follow-up, you know, which led you know, to the need you know, to develop agents which have actually longer duration, actually. And there is a lots of effort right now to, to improve you know, that, including actually the work by Tony Demis and Genentech you know, with a device, which time will tell how well this works. You know. But you know, certainly there is a, it's a very, very active area actually in, in, uh, in, in, in actually. In this actually long term, you know, ben the long term, you know, data, five years, they show that actually the study, the, the five year cat trial show 50% of patients, you know, treated with anti VEGF agent have a visual IQ with 20, 40 uh, be uh, or better. Which actually, the, this is the last you know, st sentence in the discussion. The result would have been uh, probably inconceivable before this agent were available because. Patients have been actually legally. Uh, I think it's time to, for me to end. You know, actually, and actually almost done. You know, actually, and there is a lots of effort actually in, in develop. You know, a, a, not only better anti VEGF agent. You know, better device, but also uh, find additional target. Unfort unfortunately, so far what we have seen in actually in trying to improve you know outcome of anti VEGF agent, a little bit you know parallels what we have seen in cancer. So far, it's been either disappointing or there are some mixed results, like with angiopoietins with the TIE 2. Obviously, time, time will tell. Probably the next you know, breakthrough is going to be the one which happened in the next you know, month, but only time will tell. And as I would like to conclude you know, this talk, say that you know, the, 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 VEGF, you know, the VEGF story, I believe, is uh, increase our understanding of vascular biology because the VEGF seems to be really a key regulator of it, such a fundamental process, you know. But is, there will be clearly some benefit in therapy, not only in, uh, in, in cancer, but even, even greater benefit, and no question about that, in eye disease. But there is a lots of work to do lots in, in establishing, you know, biomarkers, optimal, you know, uh, treatment and combination, and, and, and there is a lots of work in the bench. Actually, our lab is uh, very interested in doing that, and I never the time to show some recent data. We've been trying, actually, to 
find you know better VEGF inhibitor and, and maybe ways to actually to to improve you know the activity of anti VEGF agent. Maybe next time I will be able the story will be a little bit more mature. I will be able to talk about this. It is as some of the you know the colleagues you know mostly work at uh, this work was mostly done at Genentech you know in more recent work in my lab you know and I, I think you probably recognize some of these uh, characters like you know Tony and, and, and many others. With this I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Yes, I think it's a very interesting boy. Now it's also another extremely active area, you know. Unfortunately, I don't know if there is the data totally clear that there is really a cost-effect, you know, correlation. There is some confounders because you cannot do a control study, you know, right. at, at, at this time. So it, it, it is possible that actually the, uh, the, this could have happened. It could have been kind of masked, you know, by the, actually by the new vascularization. But this is a totally conceivable because there is some, an hypothesis which I think is, is floating around is actually that, you know, uh, the, the geographic atrophy reflect maybe there is actually ischemia, which result in loss of RPE, et cetera, and, and it, which can by, in, by itself, you know, can lead, you know, to neo choroidal neovascularization. And in this respect, you know, if you block, you know, that, you could potentially worsen that, you know. So there is a, an idea that if you could, you know, treat, you know, actually this, uh, this uh, ischemia, you could uh, bring about some benefit. But at this point, I, th I think uh, this is very speculative. I think it's very, uh, we don't need, know for sure whether there is actually any cause effect in a relation with the, with the, with the anti-VEGF. You know, and uh, so if anybody has any thoughts about that, I'll be very curious to know. <laughs> No, biology sometimes is not politically correct. You know, some <laughs> many many of my colleagues are very disappointed because they spend the years. But you know, it's not really unprecedented in biology. There is in some biological process there is a part which seems to be particularly important. For example, there is lots of molecules which can induce erythropoiesis or, or can conduce, you know, granulopoiesis. But at the end of the day, there is only one molecule which is really important, EPO and maybe GCSF. There is, a, not to mention, of course, like, like in some endocrine field like grotto. So uh, that's my only way to rationalize that, because to not be that this is a molecule which was selected, you know, actually to for the vasculature. Other molecules play a role, which is, uh, still, we should not, you know, discount, you know, the role of this molecule. For example, the angiopoiet in a very well-established role in developing, you know, in the assembly of the vessel wall. There is a clearly genetic data by knockout. There is also mutation, which result in malformation, etc. But to not be that as therapeutic target, that, that, that does not, is that not work very well as yet. Even though there is lots of people that believe that, you know, uh, in, in a specific, you know, population in specific condition, you can have a benefit. That's all what I can speculate. Certainly, it's, it's, it's good that we've been able to find, you know, the field has found, you know, at least a target that has uh, resulted in some benefit. I think it's a great question, actually. The, the story of the PDGF first, you know, was, was actually generating cancer, actually. There is some, some highly cited, you know, paper, for example, by, by a group at UCSF by Doug, Doug and Han, actually. Uh, the 2003 paper they, 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 that, you know, illustrated, you know, the benefit of targeting you know, VEGF with the pericyte, you know. But, but then, you know, there was a very quickly some question around about, you know, the biology, the soundness of this biology. Because if you target, you know, pericyte, you are creating essentially microvascular tree, which is a very defective, you know, that actually this is exactly what happened in the, the diabetic retinopathy. In cancer, people show that if you target, you know, pericyte, you promote, you know, metastasis. Uh, the tumor cells can crawl across, you know, actually this uh, gaps in, in among endothelial cells. I was, I was uh, to, 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 to be perfectly honest, I was very skeptical that this approach could work, you know, in, in, in ophthalmology because the biology was not, you know, there. 
People, the, the, this animal model of very contrite, you know, things which happen, events which happen in two weeks or in three weeks, instead in humans, these things happen on a very long period of time. And the analogy of, of, of uh, the diabetic retinopathy seems to be very sound. If you target, you know, pericyte, that res may result in leakiness, in, in a dysfunctional vascular bed. So maybe at the end of the day, this was really what the failure was, maybe botting in the biology, in the, in the uh, biological hypothesis, maybe in the, in, in, the, in the kind of animal model. Animal model in ophthalmology probably not you know, ideal, actually. Uh, it's very fortunate, for example, that the CMV model predicted you know, the, the effectiveness of anti-VEGF agent. But many people were extremely skeptical about that. I remember that my colleague at Genentech would tell me that, you know, what does he mean? It works in a mouse model, or even a primate model, where everything happens in a few weeks. What, what relevance can this have to do with, you know, with the human disease, which takes years and years to develop? So this, uh, unfortunately, challenged that, you know, everybody who does drug development is to face all the time. You know, I don't think it's a, there is a very clear data because uh, the animal model, once again, are not very predictive, you know, because the animal model has such a short, you know, duration. The, the PDGF, you know, seems to be a reasonable, actually, hypothesis. We cannot totally rule out that this is the case. Probably the other effect of uh, NTP, uh, the targeting of PDGF, you know, kind of sort of, you know, Counteract, like you know, the, the, the like you know, the, uh, dislodging pericyte, making you know, this uh, pericyte to poor microvascular bed. That may perhaps you know counteract some potential but beneficial effect. You know, so we cannot. I don't, I don't think we can rule out the PDG, the PDGF. You know, uh, family can be, can play a role in fibro. They do play a role in many in, in many systems. But there is other mediators who have probably not been. Equally explore, like for example, CTGF, or the, of course, the TGF beta pathway, which has, has been implicated in fibrosis in many, many, uh, many cases. You, this is certainly a very important question, which uh, we still beg for an explanation. I think it's a very, very little data to say that. Unfortunately, this study is a bit anecdotal, et cetera, so it's not totally clear what is really happening. I don't know. Uh, it would be wonderful if it, 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 this could be a real application, real effect of this anti-VEGF drug. I, I don't know. I can, I'm not in any position to give you any informed answer to this question. Some people talked about these things like in wound healing, et cetera, but you know, mm -hmm. I don't believe that you know, the benefits, you know, there were some benefits in animal modeling, some, uh, but in humans, I don't believe that there was any, any, any co compelling evidence that this happened. Excellent. Thank you so much. For Thank you.